On Tech News Today, Twitter rolls out new products and a new strategy. They've also got a new mission statement that's too long to tweet. Plus, Facebook simplifies their privacy policy, YouTube launches a new music service, and Chinese hackers force the U.S. Weather Service partially online, and then the Weather Service covered it up. All that and a lot more coming up next. This is Twit. Bandwidth for Tech News Today is provided by CashFly at C A C H E F L Y dot com. This is Tech News Today for Thursday, November 13th, 2014. This episode is brought to you by Squarespace, the all in one platform that makes it fast and easy to create your own professional website or online portfolio. Now introducing Squarespace 7 with even better site management tools and other improvements. For a free two-week trial and 10% off, go to squarespace.com and use the offer code TNT. And by ZipRecruiter. ZipRecruiter makes hiring faster, easier, and cheaper. Post your job to 50-plus job boards with one click. Try ZipRecruiter with a free four-day trial now at ZipRecruiter.com slash TNT. That's ZipRecruiter.com slash TNT. Tech News Today is a show where we talk about the tech news of the journalists who report it. Welcome to the show. I'm Mike Elgin. Good morning to you, Anthony Nielsen. How are you Mike. doing, man? I'm good. How are you? I'm doing great. We've got an action-packed show. And for one reason is that we've got Lee Hutchinson, the Senior Reviews Editor for Ars Technica with us today. Good morning to you, Lee Hutchinson. How you doing, guys? Now, you're a space nut, and you must be pretty excited about this whole comet landing business, aren't you? I am. This it's it's really cool. Although this morning there has actually been some interesting developments. So you know, last night, ESA's Philae probe landed on uh, what is it, Comet sixty seven P Churyumov Gerasimenko. I think it's is how easy you say for it. you to say. Yeah, well, I have it written down. Uh, <laughs> yeah. So the probe was supposed to land, and it was supposed to fire like a little harpoon into the into the surface of the comet to kind of winch itself and in that and, failed, and right? get secured. And right, and that and that failed. So it bounced a couple of times. And it appears that it's come to rest about a kilometer away from its intended landing target. Um, and the, ex the exact position is really hard to determine because it's very tiny and the comet, in the grand scheme of things, is also very tiny. So the difficulty, all is well. The probe is down, it's functioning, it's communicating, and everything looks good. But it looks like the position the probe is in actually puts it in a lot more shadow than was anticipated in the mission design. Uh, and it's not going to have enough electricity it's not going to be able to generate enough electricity with its solar cells to power all of the experiments that they wanted to do. So right now it's operating on a combo of internal batteries and, uh, and, and solar generation. And the priority of the ESA scientists is to figure out a way to kind of revise the mission profile to work with the reduced power budget that they have. So it's always something. Yeah, it's always something. It's obviously very difficult. It's impossible to pre predict exactly what's going to happen. And I understand oh, that sure. the first bounce, the gravity is so low compared to, say, a planet, that the first bounce, it took a, took them a couple hours to come back down after yeah, that first Yeah, it, it was more than an hour for it to come back down. And I mean, a lot of people don't realize this, this Rosetta mission that this is a part of, this has been in progress for 10 years now. The, the launch vehicle carrying this probe launched 10 years ago, and it's been sort of circling through the, through the solar system on transfer orbits to, to line up and catch the comet. So the fact that it landed, the fact that they were able to bullseye on, on this thing from that long ago and that far away is, is really, really remarkable. Yeah, just to put this in the context of uh, the tech news, this thing was launched several years before either Twitter or the iPhone existed. That's so, correct. Yeah, so it's it's pretty amazing that they got it there at all. It's still in one piece. They'll have a compromised mission to a certain extent, but still, it's it's pretty awesome stuff. The first time any human uh, endeavor has ever landed anything on a comet. Uh, as opposed to crashing it into a comet. Yeah. <laughs> All right, well, let's jump into the news. Twitter yesterday held its first ever analyst day and took the opportunity to announce new features coming in the new year and a new strategy to go with them. Kurt Wagner is a reporter for Recode and joins us now. Welcome to you, Kurt Wagner. Thanks again for having me. Twitter's new mission statement is too long for a tweet. It's uh, <laughs> I'm going to quote it here. It's, quote, reach the largest daily audience in the world by connecting everyone to their world via our information sharing and distribution platform products and be one of the top revenue generating internet companies in the world. This looks like amateur hour to me. Is there any yeah. quality or value in this mission statement that you can discern? So my understanding is it's not their real mission statement. Uh, Dick Costolo tweeted last night saying, hey, our mission statement has stayed the same as it was uh, previously, this was simply uh, a poorly worded slide during their presentation, if you will. So I wouldn't look too much into it in terms of this is, uh, you know, something that, that that's going to be 
strung up in writing on the walls of Twitter headquarters from now on. Although it sounds a little Dilbert esque, it is. It's it's it is rather fun. I think the word uh, "world" was in there maybe three or four times. Three times, so certainly <laughs> in one not sentence. Most well scripted uh, piece of literature that they've ever turned out. Yeah, and it's it's also amateurish in the sense, you know, as a mission statement. Again, it's not a mission statement, but still, to go in there and just talk about, oh, we want to make tons and tons of money. That's what we're all about. <laughs> you know, usually, at least, haven't they seen uh, the, the 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 HBO series Silicon Valley? You're supposed to talk about changing the world and, uh, right. and all that kind of stuff. You're not supposed to say we're going to make scads of money. We're just going to make huge swimming pools full of cash. Uh, well, it made made sense maybe for uh, an analyst day when they're talking to all the Wall Street <laughs> people. They they're, they're the ones who want to hear that mission statement. The rest of us, not so much. Well, that again is also amateur hour because you want to temper their expectations. You want you don't want to say we're going to make tons and tons and tons of money and have a gazillion users. And we're going to monetize everything and everyone, and then sort of have you know incremental growth that makes everybody like freak out and think that there's been a huge disaster. Now let's talk about some of the direction that they're going in. They've kind of been face sizing themselves if you if that's a word for quite a while and their 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 announced product strategy looks like it's going toward the direction of Facebook for example they're talking about unbundled apps they want multiple Twitter apps do you know anything more about what they're planning I mean obviously they're probably going to have the messaging app that's going to have direct messages as a kind of messaging service uh, what else do you think Twitter could actually have as independent mobile apps you know, they didn't talk uh, about specific avenues they want to go down, and, and not that we would expect them to unveil that element of their product roadmap. But you mentioned messaging as something that I think a lot of us would assume uh, that a standalone messaging app would make sense. Uh, Facebook does that. Uh, Google obviously has Hangouts. So th there's a lot of other big tech companies that have gone that way. Although from conversations I've had with people inside Twitter, they, they don't see themselves uh, so much as a direct telecommunications company. So, uh, you know, a standalone one-to-one -one messaging service. They, they may just try to improve their direct messaging feature, which is already part of the app. Um, the, uh, otherwise, it's, it's a little bit of a mystery to see what kind of standalone apps they might come up with. I would imagine they might do something with the third-party developers. They unveiled Fabric, which is a big developer SDK um, uh, offering that they uh, came out with a few weeks ago. And uh, they already have Vine, which is video, which would have been the other really uh, logical um, app choice for them. So it'll be intriguing to see if they go for more of a developer side or a consumer side uh, when they start unrolling these new apps. Yeah, so Kurt, I mean, you use, if you're, you, if you're anything like me, you use Twitter constantly every day. It's a major part of your workflow. It definitely is for mine. I know, Mike, we've talked about this on a past show before. Is, is any of this new stuff that, that Twitter is discussing in this, in this, in this conference? I mean, there's, there's what they're telling analysts that they want to do, and then there's what folks like us are actually using the service for. Is there ever going to be really kind of a, kind of a parallel between these two things, or, or is the, the analyst line and the daily user line going to just continue to go like this? Uh, I think that there's certainly some parallel, right? Because um, those of us who are using the app every day are really the what's keeping the business going and what's going to keep the business going. So I think that in terms of improving the product, uh, they're simultaneously improving the view that analysts are going to have uh, about the company. So for example, they announced that they were going to unveil a, a video capabilities for Twitter. So instead of having to take a video through Vine and upload it that way, you'd be able to shoot video through the app, uh, edit it within the app, and then share it directly to Twitter. And I think that that's important, right? I mean, that's a consumer-facing product, but I think that it, it paints a little bit of a picture of Twitter of saying, hey, we're video-friendly. Uh, maybe video ads are coming down, down the pipeline, kind of like what Facebook did. We're going to make people familiar with video, and then we're going to start to do more video ads or already beta testing video ads. So I think that there's ways to draw parallels between the consumer updates that they have and, and what they're trying to convey to Wall Street uh, right now, although, as you mentioned, it's not always super clear. Now, um, some of these improvements look like just great improvements. For example, they have something called the instant timeline, which mm -hmm. means that brand new users will come to Twitter and actually see something happening. That's a big problem on, on social networks like Twitter. You know, that's, that happened to me, actually, in 2007. Uh, I think Twitter was uh, pr pretty new, and I went there 2006, 2007, whenever it was. And I, was, I sort of like, there didn't seem to be anything going on. I followed a couple people. It didn't seem to be all that active. Now, in the, in the near future, new users are going to get this wall of really high-quality curated content from Twitter. Great idea, Twitter. Another one is uh, something called the uh, Timeline Highlights. <clears throat> Excuse me. 
So one of the things that happens right now is that uh, unlike Facebook or some other social networks, Twitter is sort of this conveyor belt that's going by. And when you have time to pay attention, you watch what's there at that time. And then when you're gone, you sort of miss what happened while you were gone. Well, they're going to sort of zip up some of the highlights from that and sort of greet you when you return with some high quality content. This sounds like great stuff. And I don't see any reason not to do this. In general, it sounds like they're really going to Im improve the service. I'm a little worried about the algorithmic filtering type uh, improvements that they want to make and also how they're going to sort of monetize with, who knows, uh, inevitably, probably, automatically playing ads, that, that kind of thing. In general, do you think that Twitter will be able to grow as they say they intend to grow. I mean, they're, they're, they're looking at big growth. They're looking at bringing in people who, who, who use the service without actually logging in. They have a lot of uh, plans, that, you know, of, of, of getting people engaged. Do you think that the general package overall with what they're talking about yesterday is enough to do it? I'm still a little skeptical. Uh, growth has been their biggest challenge to this point. Every time they unveil uh, their earnings, Everyone always immediately looks to the growth numbers. And so far, it's kind of been a disappointment every single quarter. Uh, that's, a little, that's a little bit of an exaggeration. But what Twitter's really trying to do here is they're trying to uh, eliminate these barriers to getting new users. So as you mentioned, the instant timeline. I mean, if I'm a new user to Twitter and I hear everyone talking about, oh, this happened on Twitter, this happened on Twitter, and I'm like, hey, this is great. I want to sign up for the service and see what's going on. And I sign up. I'm not following anybody, so I'm just staring at a blank screen. Uh, I don't really get hooked the way that Twitter wants you to get hooked. So that's what they're trying to do with Instant Timeline. They're trying to say, hey, when you sign up, you're immediately going to be thrown into the mix and, and you're going to see the value of Twitter. So I think that as they do things like that, um, that will hopefully bring people to the service that, that have been maybe testing it out but haven't really latched on. And they un unveiled a funny uh, metric yesterday. They said 125 million people come to the twitter.com homepage every month and then leave. So that means they either didn't log in or they didn't create an account. But that's 125 million people who could become Twitter users. So if they can figure out a way to make their home screen better too, maybe add some tweets on the home screen so that when you show up, you see what Twitter's all about right from the get-go, um, those kinds of things might uh, lead people to create accounts as well. And, and obviously that's what's ultimately going to spur the growth that they've Kind of promise. I'm really skeptical about how much they really know about all these numbers they're throwing around. For example, <laughs> people go to the website without logging in. They don't know whether those people are members or users already and just aren't logging in. They also don't know, I don't think exactly how many people have multiple accounts. I personally have like six or seven accounts. Are they mm -hmm. counting me as six or seven people? I don't know that. So I, I think that uh, it would be great to have more transparency here. Of course, they have vastly more transparency than yeah. Google does with Google Plus, which is like zero transparency, but still. <laughs> Anyway, so it's it's interesting to see these numbers being thrown around because I haven't seen any evidence that they really know what they're talking about exactly, uh, and if they're going to grow and convince uh, you know their their shareholders that they're actually growing, they're going to have to have better and more solid numbers. Kurt Wagner is at Recode.net. You can follow him on Twitter at Kurt Wagner Eight. Thanks for joining us, Kurt Wagner. Uh, absolutely. Thanks for having me. All right. Well, in just a minute, I want to tell you about what's happening with Facebook. But first, I'm going to tell you about Squarespace. You know, Squarespace will take care of every aspect of building an awesome website except for one. For example, they'll take care of the design. They have incredibly beautiful templates. They've got some brand new templates coming up as well. They've got incredibly great hosting. They've got incredibly great tech support and help and, and tutorials. The only part that they can't help you with is your part, the part that what's the words and the pictures that you choose to put on your website or your blog. But they do help you with that now with Squarespace 7 because I know I've been building blogs for many, many years and running websites for a long, long time. And I know that the more inviting the web tool is, the more uh, you're likely to build high quality content and to update your site, your blog, more often. And Squarespace 7, which has just been released, allows you to live edit on screen. You don't have to toggle anymore between the sort of manage your blog view and the here's what the blog looks like view. They're now the same view. And it's so inviting for you to update your, your content. It's actually fun for you to, to uh, monitor and build stuff and add posts and do all the things that you're going to do with your site because Squarespace 7 makes it so incredible. And your site is going to be look great, not just beyond their incredible templates, but they now have stock photography from Getty. Getty, I'm telling you, this is like this is the the gold standard in in uh, in uh, uh, stock photography, and they have instant branded email that they just set up with Google Apps. So if you're a Google Apps user, this is gonna be awesome for you. 
And of course, if you're a developer, this is great stuff as well. They're now uh, giving you the tools that they use internally. So it's really, really powerful stuff. And of course, they're mobile ready. The Squarespace portfolio, Note, Metric, and Blog mobile apps are on-the-go extensions of your website. And now they even have Note and Blog apps for Android. So if you're an Android fan, you are going to love managing your blog from your Android device. Start a free two-week trial with no credit card required and start building your website. When you decide to sign up for Squarespace, make sure you use the offer code TNT and that'll get you 10% off the low price and it'll also show your support for Tech News Today. And to begin using Squarespace 7, if you're already a user, and I hope you are, just go to the settings tab to activate all the new features. You are going to absolutely love them. We thank Squarespace for their support of Tech News Today. And remember that a better web awaits and it starts with your new Squarespace website. Well, Facebook rewrote its privacy policy. The company made it much shorter and much clearer. The new policy even includes an interactive tutorial called Privacy Basics. The company's goal is to make the information about Facebook as clear as possible, according to the company's chief, chief privacy officer. Facebook is inviting users to comment on the policy for a week. And after reading the comments, Facebook plans to release a final version. Reid Albergati covers Facebook and other topics for The Wall Street Journal and joins us now. Hey, Reid. Hi, thanks for having me. Thanks for being here. Now, were you impressed by the new privacy policy? Is Facebook actually getting better at communicating with users? Yeah, you know, I, I don't know if I would use the term impressed, but I think, you know, after talking to some privacy experts, uh, it is it is a step in the right direction because it is a lot simpler. Um, it's it's color-coded, it's got graphics, it uses plainer language. I mean, one of the big complaints of the privacy policy before is that it was really legalese and it was very long. Um, this cuts the size down by 70%. That's seven zero. So you might think, well, what did they take out? Um, you know, are they being too vague? Well, this doesn't actually to gather the personal information it's allowed to use about you, but it, it's, it is definitely not going into as much detail. So, um, you know, it, I think, what they want here is users to actually read the privacy policy. And, um, you know, I'd have to say I'm a little skeptical whether anybody on the Internet really reads any privacy policy. So we'll see. Reed, so, hey, you know, this isn't the first time Facebook has revised a privacy policy. In fact, you know, this is like the the ten hundred thousandth time Facebook has revised a privacy policy, right? Do you do you think that this is actually going to lead to real change this time, both in Facebook's response to privacy violations and in and in like user behavior, or do you think this is just more privacy theater? No, in fact, I mean they're very clear that there there is not a change that's happening with this with this privacy policy. It's really it's more about presentation than it is about substance of privacy. I mean, the reality is, you know, Facebook will continue to gather personal information from its users as they use the service. You know, when they like something, when they make a post, when they friend someone, all of that information is, is being collected by Facebook and it's being used to send users targeted ads. And that will not change. But, you know, I think what this does is it changes the appearance of Facebook. It's all, it's all part of this effort for Facebook to tell the public, look, we're doing the best we can to inform people about really what they're getting themselves into when they use Facebook. And, you know, it, does that satisfy privacy experts, or privacy advocates completely? No. I mean, they, they would like to see more regulation on what Facebook is actually allowed to, to gather about its users and how it's allowed to use that information. Um, but that doesn't seem like it's on the horizon anytime soon. So, you know, this is, I think this is more of an optics decision. And you can't really fault them. At least I, I can't see a lot of fault here. I mean, they do what they do. And I've slammed Facebook in the past for being sort of less than clear about their privacy policy. It sounds like they genuinely are trying to be very, very clear and talk about all the things they do. For example, one of the things that uh, I learned uh, in this whole story is that the purchases, they, they say flat out very clearly now that purchases made on Facebook uh, will involve Facebook collecting the credit card information and the shipping locations and the contact details. Uh, is that for thing, I mean, what, what are they talking about there? Is that for third party purchases? If I see an ad and I click through the ad and buy something, is that a case in which they would be getting my credit card information? Well, look, Facebook has been gathering users' credit card information for a long time now. The, the Zynga, you know, was a, plat, was a game platform or a game system built on the Facebook platform. 
And in order to use it and make in-app purchases in these games, you know, people had to supply their credit card information. It also collects credit card details from advertisers, of which there are more than a million. So it's no, uh, this it's not a newcomer to credit card data. And in fact, the old the old policy dealt with this issue already, but it is testing a new feature called the Buy Now feature, which will allow users to purchase items right in within an advertisement that they see. So you might see an ad for you know a new pair of shoes. You could click buy now and, and purchase the item. Now Facebook won't be actually selling it to them like Amazon does, but it'll be working with third parties to facilitate that sale. And so it's now much more clear that you know if you do decide to buy something on Facebook, you will be giving your credit card info. Now let me just say, I mean, if you're putting in your credit card details on Facebook and you don't think that Facebook's collecting your credit card information, I don't think you're the type of person who's also going to go and read a 13-page <laughs> privacy policy. Absolutely. It's a good point. Well, Reed Albergati, you can catch up with him at WSJ.com and you can find him on Twitter at Reed Albergati. Thanks for joining us, Reed. Thanks for having me. YouTube yesterday unveiled YouTube Music Key, a service that offers high-quality audio songs and zero advertising for 10 bucks a month. A beta version of the service will be available in the United States, Britain, and a few European countries by invitation only, with a public rollout scheduled for next year. The beta version will be free for six months and then cost $8 a month. Joan E. Salzman is a reporter for CNET and joins us now. Welcome to you, Joan. Hi, how are you doing? I'm doing great, thanks. Now, what do we know about the benefits and qualities of this new music service? For example, what kind of catalog are they likely to have by the time they open to the public? Well, they are probably going to have a catalog that will be similar to what you could get on any kind of subscription streaming service. They have the deals in place with the major labels and also have secured deals with a substantial number of independent labels so that it will be a competitive catalog of music for people to compare to. There's always going to be differences between one streaming service to another, but the... Um, Key thing is when it's, you know, 14 million songs versus 30 million songs versus it's millions and millions and millions of songs. So there'll be a lot there. So this isn't just going to be carrying forward like the, the Vivo content that YouTube already has, right? This is going to be a whole new separate thing with separate branding and separate, you know, like a separate, um, no, there's no ads and it's a different revenue stream, right? Yeah, well, there's no ads. That's the point of part of the point of having a subscription element to it. There's going to be videos, and V and YouTube is a uh, investor in Vivo. Google is um, YouTube's parent. So um, the catalog that Vivo has, um, which is from Universal, is going to be part of it. The subscription service will have video. It will have no ads. It will allow you to cache things, uh, cache music on your mobile device. So if you go offline, you can listen to it if you're on the subway or if you're on a plane. Um, it'll have those kind of features to lure in people to actually pay. Now, in terms of it being a separate thing, a different branded thing, it's going to be married with Google's purely audio streaming uh, subscription service, which is Google Play Music. It's uh, basically the same thing as Apple's Beats Music is. Uh, it's one of those subscription-only services that uh, has purely the audio of millions and millions of songs available. So if people subscribe either to Google Play Music or to the coming YouTube music key, you'll have access to both of those services for the same roughly $10 price, $10 a month price. Now, it sounds like something that will be uh, a, a benefit for some users. Uh, some people are going to love it. Others may be confused by it. Google is not very good at doing that Apple thing where they give you the one service. Of course, Apple now has a couple of music services too. But <laughs> um, but as we learned with, you know, Google's coming out with a messenger app <laughs> that competes with Hangouts and it's like, what's the difference? What, you know, where do they intersect, et cetera? That, that's the kind of thing that Google always does. And this is another example of that. But I guess the question is, how is the music service going to like this? Are they going to feel like they're adequately monetizing uh this uh, this music service, or is this going to be another place where they feel like they're not getting paid what they deserve? Are you, are you talking about music labels, or are you talking about musicians? I'm There's talking about, let's start with the labels. 
<laughs> the labels love subscription music services um, more so than the kind of free free tier that is often associated with, like for example, with a Spotify, and also in the case of YouTube. Um, there's the option for people to watch some of watch and listen to a lot of content for free on YouTube uh, via things like Vivo videos um, and with the relationships that YouTube had to build with labels in order to launch a subscription service. They're also getting a lot of capabilities to play things like entire discographies of artists on the free tier, the advertising supported tier. So labels generally, they really, really, really like subscription options. The way that they look at it is they're taking people who weren't paying for either weren't paying for music at all and were just watching it and turning over through a series of steps turning over some advertising revenue which isn't a whole lot into people into customers that are spending uh, basically 120 dollars a year on music when they hadn't been spending any and so the main goal that labels have is to get more and more people to kind of upsell into that subscription tier. That's the kind of tantalizing hook that YouTube is able to offer. The idea that the, that YouTube, A, just is huge. The audience of YouTube, the people that use YouTube, it's more than a billion unique visitors every month. That's massive. And so if you can convert a very, very small number of those people into people that are paying $10 a month, then you're getting, then you're really starting to reach scale with a subscription model. Okay, so the big question is, what is Taylor Swift going to think of this? <laughs> well, Taylor Swift is curious. <laughs> <laughs> so we know that she doesn't like Spotify, but the funny thing is she's kept all of her stuff on YouTube so far. And right now, everything on YouTube is free. The, the music key service, the subscription paid service, it hasn't even launched yet. It's not even going to go into, it's going to go into beta next week. And so even that means that it's not, publicly available to the widespread population for who knows how long. So even though she's been very vocal about how Spotify in particular devalues music, how it rips artists off and doesn't pay them enough, she's still been keeping a lot of her catalog on plenty of other completely free services, just like YouTube. So I don't exactly know how she feels about music key but I, I to be honest i don't really exactly understand how she feels about spotify either <laughs> joan e salzman is at cnet.com you can follow her on twitter at joan underscore e thanks for joining us joan sure thank you all right and lee hutchinson had to depart he had a uh, an appointment to to make and we thank him for joining us as our co-anchor today we've got a few more news stories to, to to do for you starting with this one hackers from china recently breached the u.s government's national weather system forcing cybersecurity teams to withhold vital weather data used for disaster planning aviation shipping and other uses for two days according to an exclusive in the washington post the outage degraded the accuracy of the national weather service's long-range forecast the Washington Post also reports that the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, which includes the National Weather Service, covered up the breach and failed even to notify authorities within the U.S. government. The agency has not disclosed whether classified data has been stolen. China routinely denies hacking charges. They had a, a person from the embassy uh, make a general statement about how you shouldn't be quick to point fingers after this hack, but they haven't explicitly denied it. That denial is no doubt coming very soon. Samsung announced some really interesting products yesterday at its developers conference, including something called Samsung Flow, which is like Apple handoff, which is part of Apple's continuity. It shoots open tasks like directions on Google Maps from phone to tablet to laptop. And so that's really interesting. They also have a SIM band wearable. This is the second version. It's a health tracker that, uh, that gathers biometric data, including blood flow, EKG levels, and skin temperature. It's all stored on SAMI, which is the company's open and cloud-based database for health. They even came out with a price for the Gear VR Innovator Edition. This is uh, the uh, virtual reality headset we've talked about several times on this show. They're going to launch in the U.S. in December in two versions, $199 and with a Bluetooth controller for $249. And they finally, they uh, announced Project Beyond in conjunction with the Gear VR headset. It's a 360-degree video camera 
uh, that does it in 3D. It has 16 full HD cameras and a cooling system and wide-angle optics. One of the things you can do with this is you'll be able to place it in a location, let's say at a concert or, or in a room somewhere, and then you can use the Gear VR headset to sort of be there in real time. You can look around the room and all those high-def cameras will show you what you would see if your head was right there where, the, where this Project Beyond uh, is. Sounds like a really, really cool product. Well, the University of California, Berkeley, and Deutsche Telekom Innovation Laboratories are working on a smartphone app that can warn people of earthquakes seconds before they strike. It's called the MyShake app. Berkeley already has a desktop app called ShakeAlert that uses data from some 400 seismometers to warn about earthquakes. But what's interesting about MyShake is that it collects data, too. It uses the sensors in users' smartphones to detect when the phone is on a table or other surface and then it can recognize vibrations caused by movement in the earth and then send that bat data back to a central place to be combined with seismometer data. It's basically crowdsourcing uh, earthquake measurements. The app will use a freemium model. The earthquake information is free, but alerts customized by severity and location will be available for subscription of $2.99 for three months, $5.99 for six months, or $9.99 a year. In just a sec, we're going to tell you about a new possible uh, merger coming up but first, I want to tell you about ZipRecruiter. ZipRecruiter is the way to hire the best people and to do it fast without wasting your time. The way they do that is they put your job on 50-plus job sites, including Craigslist, LinkedIn, and Twitter, with a single click. You post once and watch the qualified candidates roll in to ZipRecruiter's easy-to-use interface. This is really going to give you a huge break in your hiring, and it's going to improve the way you hire, and it's going to enable you to hire better people. Now, you don't have to juggle with emails or calls to your office. You just screen candidates quickly. You rate them, and you hire the right person fast. You don't want to do this the old way. You want to do this the new way with ZipRecruiter. That's why they've been used by over 250,000 businesses. And right now, TNT fans can try ZipRecruiter for a free four-day trial. Just go to ZipRecruiter.com slash TNT. That's ZipRecruiter.com slash TNT. And we thank ZipRecruiter for their support of Tech News Today. Well, here's a weird one. The toy maker Hasbro is in talks to buy DreamWorks Animation. That's right. A toy maker is in talks to buy a movie studio. The combined company would be called DreamWorks Hasbro. Hollywood mogul Jeffrey Katzenberg would chair the combined company. Deadline is reporting that any deal would be at least two months away. But this is an example of the fact that the, the real money in movies or any sort of content is in the merchandise. So Hasbro wants to really pump up the toys they can sell by controlling the movies that generate interest in those very toys. Well, Sony is launching a new web-based television service called PlayStation View. Just like it sounds, the service would initially require a PlayStation gaming console. PlayStation View will offer live and on-demand TV that's searchable and personal personalizable. The company plans to announce the service today in New York. Got a few updates for you. We've been covering the rancorous pricing negotiations between book giant Amazon and Hachette, a major publishing company. During the dispute, Amazon was accused of leveraging its book-selling dominance to squeeze Hachette by withholding pre-orders of Hachette books. Even major authors got involved in a letter-writing campaign to Amazon's board of directors. We reported all that to you earlier this year. Now, this morning, the company's announced that they've kissed and made up and have also signed a new multi-year contract. In other news, researchers at NASA's Ames Research Laboratory Center in California have created a biodegradable drone. The idea could be useful as a spy drone that might melt away after crashing, leaving little evidence that was ever there. It might also, as the researchers have said, prevent drones in the future that are going to be so common from littering the landscape. The biodrone prototype is made of a fungus called mycelium, and it's covered in cellulose sheets grown in the lab using bacteria. The electronic circuits were printed in silver nanoparticle ink. The propellers and battery are pretty standard and they won't biodegrade. The team is working on the creation of sensors using E. coli bacteria somehow. Well, our TNT fan of the day is Eric Constant, who posted this picture on Twitter. He says he listens to TNT on his phone while working on the Papineau Labelle Wildlife Refuge in Quebec, Canada. Look at that. Wow, he looks like he's out there for a while. <laughs> is that a suitcase? I don't know. I don't know what's going on there. 
Anyway, how do you watch or listen to TNT? Just record a video or take a picture of your setup and post it on Google+, Twitter, or Facebook, and use the hashtag HowIWatchTNT, and that's how we'll find it. We'll search for the hash hashtag. That is the tech news today. Again, we thank Lee Hutchinson for joining us as our co-anchor today, and you can subscribe on Tech News Today on Stitcher, iTunes, YouTube, Feely, Yahoo, RSS. So many options. Choose your favorite at twit.tv slash TNT. And you can follow us on Twitter at Tech News Today TV. Send us your thoughts and opinions by email to TNT at twit.tv or voicemail 260-TNT-SHOW is our number. And don't miss our evening newscast, Tech News Tonight at 4 p.m. Pacific tonight and every weeknight right here on the Twit Network. My name is Mike Elgin. Thanks for tuning in. We'll see you tomorrow.